All right, what's up, Huntley community and hunters that will soon be joining our community after watching this video. We're going to take you inside the 2024 Spring Turkey League Championship and give you a glimpse as to what makes this Hunt League app, our leagues, and this community so incredible. First off, the Hunt League app works as a digital hunting journal in the field. You can select between multiple methods of take and dozens of species to log a hunt, a scout, a pack out, or a mentoring activity. While on the hunt, you can log events in real time, such as a sighting, sound, shot fired, or success. And with each event, you can add pictures, video, audio, notes, and more. The app automatically captures a timestamp and the GPS location and organizes everything for you inside a hunt log. Your hunt logs are completely private unless you choose to share them. Your honey holes and your hunting spots, they are yours. And in the words of Gandalf the Great, Keep it secret, keep it safe. Now let's bring you into our leagues and what makes them so amazing. First off, our leagues are not a traditional hunting contest. It's not about who kills the most or who kills the biggest. These are story-based leagues, as we believe that every story is important and you can learn just as much, if not more, from your failures as you can your success. The Hunt League app is built to not only capture the story of a specific hunt, but the story of a season. How many days you've spent scouting, on the hunt, training, shooting, contributing to conservation while you invest in yourself and others. If you are an ego maniac looking for somebody to stroke your ego, check out Instagram. I think you are gonna absolutely love it. If you're a hardworking dad, a person that enjoys wild food and recipes, or a wild girl that loves the thrill of the hunt, Hunt League is your huckleberry. All right, let's dive into the action of the 2024 Spring Turkey League so that you can see what I'm talking about and what this community is all about. Let us know in the comments, who would you select as the 2024 Gobbler King? Hunt League has several different leagues from the Spring Turkey, the Apex Predator, the Western Hunter, the Outdoorsman of the Year, the Deer of the Year, or even our Wild Food League. Hunters not only win a league title, but an incredible prize package from companies that want to hear and celebrate your stories from the field. In this Turkey League alone, we have EAA, Burris Optics, Remington, Alps Outdoors, and Cane Break Call Company that have put together an incredible turkey prize package for the league winner. Let's get into the action and let me introduce you to our first finalist, Jordan Linscomb from Colorado. Wait, wait, wait. Hey, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. You hit it, you got it. But it's still alive. He's not going. Way to go, bear. Yes! <laughs> in my underwear! <laughs> That's... Why, why are you in your underwear? I was swimming in a creek. That's uh, awesome, bear. Are you sure he's dead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Try raises right now. I've got three extroverted, loud, amazing boys. And I said, we got to get Bear out for his turkey hunt. We won't have a lot of chances. So it took off early one morning, went to this prime area. The boys know it. They've been before with me. Um, but it's a bit of a challenge to get three boys to be quiet for a turkey hunt. You have to be stealthy. You have to be mindful. So I was like, let's do it anyways. Let's get them out there and make the memory. So uh, we saw plenty going in in the morning. But as we got out and started walking around, we really couldn't find them for a while. Uh, three or four hours in, the boys were getting bored. And they knew about this creek there because they had swam in it one fall in the past on another turkey hunt. And they're like, Dad, can we jump in? I, I warned them. I'm like, that's ice melts. Like, it's early spring. If you want to, you can because I know you're kind of getting bored. And it's always a balance of, like, keeping the kids engaged and entertained and having fun versus dreading a hunt. So told them to jump in. Two of the three boys jumped in. It was freezing. They were screaming. I told them, stay here. I'm going to go get the truck. I think we're done for today. On my way back to the truck, I just kept calling throughout their swim and on my way back. And then I realized there's two gobblers coming from either direction. So fast forward, I had to get my boy out of the water. You saw the video and he harvested his first Colorado turkey there uh, in his underwear after taking a swim. So it was an incredible morning. It, it went from like, we're done, we're going home to like, oh, amazing memory and the day was made. So a fantastic day with my boys out there hunting. Jordan, you got 10 minutes 
on the clock with the judges. You've got Chase from EAA who makes one of the coolest and best shotguns out there for turkey hunters. Um, you've got Audrey from Remington Ammunition. She's down there in Arkansas. And then uh, last year's turkey hunting champion, Cody Monzi, the 2023 Gobbler King. What's going on, Jordan? I'm Chase. So I guess my question, my first question for you would be, you know, you got to go on a youth hunt with your kid. Like, how did that actually make you feel? Like, obviously, we saw how he felt. But it's, you know, from a dad's perspective, because I've got a seven-year-old that's, like, jumping up and down trying to get to take her right now. So that's what I'm curious about. How is it for you on that end? Yeah, it was so fulfilling. It was amazing. Great to meet you, Chase, and all of you. But um, I told my kids, when you're five years old, you can start coming hunting with me. So... Fast forward, you know, that oldest son who got the turkey, he's been coming with me for eight, nine years now. Um, But this was his first chance to have like a premier tag for Colorado turkey. Um, And I had a good feeling about it, but I was like, I just, we just got to carve out the time. And uh, so to to be able to do that and get him out there, I was hoping it would happen the first day. Um, and thankfully at the last minute there, it did, but it's just so magical. Um, you know, just to get them out there is great. He's been very patient with me to go on a lot of hunts and see no harvests, you know, do hard hikes and things. So that one was just really unforgettable to come home with a, with a win. And, uh, and he was like, man, dad, this is so easy to clean compared to an elk or a deer or something. So he was all about it. One of my questions, you said that you were calling on your way back to the truck. Do you, you know, take the time to teach your your sons how to call so maybe one day they can do this for themselves? Yeah, for sure. So we, um, I let them do it and learn. And of course, it's, you know, everything learning along the way, it starts rough, but you got to start somewhere. So uh, we've had a couple of years of trying. Um, he's been with me, you know, when we've called some in pretty close, have him at 30 yards, and then I blew it. And I messed up and we have the talk on the way back to the truck of like, hey, what did we learn? How did how we do better? So I've loved trying to get them involved, even though it's imperfect. Right. It starts somewhere and um, making them feel ownership of the process. Um, and so that day I was doing most of the calling. And when we were by the river where they were swimming, it was so loud. I couldn't hear anything. But in my head, I was like, hey, we're here. It's three thirty. I'm going to keep calling. But what I didn't realize is they were calling back probably that whole time, but I couldn't hear them okay. until I got away from the river. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my goodness, there's two in different directions coming right at us. That's awesome. Love to hear that. Hey, Jordan. Hi, uh, Cody. Once again, congrats. Uh, it's fun. Fun sitting on that side for sure. Um, just a quick question. You said that this was your son's chance at a premier tag. I assume it was some kind of a draw. Is this a new area for you guys to hunt? Or is it somewhere you've been in before where you had some history? Uh, we had some history there. Um, I I pulled a fall tag for there years back, but was unsuccessful. But we made some great memories um, with all three boys. So when I told them, hey, we get to go back to that place, um, I was like, hey, you remember where you jumped in the river or we built that fort in the tall grass? And they're like, oh, yeah, totally, Dad. We remember. So it was fun to go back. But in the spring, you know, when they're talking they're to me and there's a lot more action. So um, second time they're hunting. Um, but as a grown man, it would take me 15 years to pull that tag for spring. So just love the Colorado program and how they, they honor the youth. And I say they get them hooked like credit cards and ski passes. You know, they want to get them involved really early on. And I don't blame them, but uh, it was pretty cool that he drew for that area. So they were obviously having a good time playing in the creek or whatever. So when you when you realized they were hammering and you had two going at the same time when you got back to you know, like how long was that by the time you got back to the boys to the time he was actually able to shoot the tom? Yeah, I had walked about 100 yards, 150 away from the creek. And um, and they were out of the water. You know, I told them, like, stay safe, stay on the shore here. But then I – so I rushed back. You don't want to yell, right? Because the things can hear you. Yeah. So um, I got close enough where I could communicate, signal, just come, you know, like you can't get fully dressed. There's no time for that. So I got him coming my direction. And then um, from then till about the time he shot, it was probably 25 minutes. And that was um, some of the some of the school of hard knocks, at least for us as turkey hunters, is we've been too impatient sometimes. Um, and so 
we had him in place. We had a decoy right next to us. And he's like, dad, should I put the decoy out or not? And I was like, no, we're just going to wait because we've already blown it on other hunts. And he already hears us. He knows where he, he knows that girl is here or around. So um, I was like, patient. And then it's within 200 yards of us the whole time. But um, as it got closer, there was that temptation to move or just try. And I was like, let's just wait. Let's just wait. And sure enough, you know, again, 25 minutes or so, he came right where we needed him. That's cool. Because I, I, I would definitely think that it is very difficult for them to stay patient for that. It's difficult enough for us adults to stay patient to get on one. And one of, especially once hammering away, you know he's coming. Like, for sure. Just having to sit. So trying to keep a 14 year old reined in. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. So there was an 11 year old behind us and we had to get him in position, kind of out of position. And then the nine year old, thankfully he listened and uh, kind of stayed near the Creek. But for a little while I was like, this is going to be a small miracle if we pull this off. And um, that gobbler eventually we can see some motion and eventually see his head. And then still another about three or four minutes, from the time you see him until he gets right in line where we wanted him. And, um, and it was just so beautiful, such a moment. One of the things that I love about your story is that you like to balance hunting and fun. You know, you don't want them to just be hating their lives the whole time because you want them to want to come back. Right? right. So how do you make that call? Like, okay, guys, let's just have a good time. Let's get in the river. Yeah. I've always tried to bring lots of snacks. And then think like have a plan B and a plan C of like, okay, if today gets too uptight or too tense or too boring, like what do I do as a dad to keep it interesting and keep it fun? Cause I'd much rather them hunt for life, you know, God willing. And if they want to versus like dad pushed me too hard and I hate this. So um, yeah, it's just having options and then trying to read the moment. Um, I literally was walking away thinking, crud, I've got to get up on another day at three 30 and get them him or them back out here, we're going to have to try again. Um, and it worked out before we, before we left, but, um, I think it's just a flexibility reading the moment and then no one just, um, when do you make it a fun outdoor moment versus like, Hey, you're right in the hunt and there with the animal. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, kids, kids are the future. So you, you gotta, you gotta keep them locked in. Absolutely. looks like we might have time for just one more. Uh, of course you're already doing a fantastic job of introducing your boys to the sport. Um, which is crucial for, you know, the longevity of the sport. But are you a part of any other organizations or any other conservation uh, efforts to help, you know, turkeys in Colorado or in your area? Um, I am a lifetime member of Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation so far. Um, we'll look forward to getting more involved in the turkey foundations or organizations as well, too. I love it. Um, I so I love too that, you know, I talked with my boys every hunt. I was like, hey, Benjamin Franklin said, this should be our national bird. You know, not the bald eagle, if we go back in history. Yeah. And then we just unpack that story of like, this bird is so smart. It's so resilient. It's so across the 48 or whatever, 50 states. Um, so it's just a really cool um, discussion each time we go out as well too, though, of like, this bird means a lot to our country, um, to our traditions, to our history, to our holidays. So. Um, yeah, I look forward to getting more involved. And I think we're just getting rolling with our, our history of turkey hunting as a family, at least with success. Looking forward to more to come. I'm sitting here listening the whole time with a smile ear to ear. Like I can just imagine being out there with my boys. And, uh, you know, we've tried it a couple of times with my boys. And it is hard to do when you got multiple people, a lot of moving parts, keeping them engaged. And out here in Colorado, it seems like you're either going out on a blistering hot day or it's like freezing cold. I'm like, why are we even out here? So you just seem to like everything came together for that just to be this incredibly special memory with you and the boys. So um, do you have any final words that you want to share? Yeah, for sure. Well, I just would say thank you guys for the chance to be in the contest here. My dad taught me to hunt when I was five years old. Um, I crawled in his lap, pulled the trigger on my first whitetail buck in Texas, and I was hooked ever since then. And so as my children have gotten older, to have the privilege to pass on that heritage. Um, I remember hunting with both of my grandfathers and my dad. So now to have my boys involved is uh, just truly a, a privilege and an honor. Like I said, it it's really more about the overall success of the experience. Sure, you want to take home game um, and have that prize, but um, I'm really happy with the trajectory and the direction we're going. 
Um, and also for Jared, I always love Hunt League. Tell people all about it all the time, spreading the word. And uh, it's fun to pull out with the kids and use the app and keep keep track of our logs and everything together. So honored to be here with all of you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Shot my decoy. Give the decoy a shake. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Let out a uh, crow call. Wow! Uh, one hammer's back from it over there at the truck. My family's in the truck, like right over here. Homie stopped, 10 yards, boom, dead bird. Yeah, so my season this year was focused mostly around family. Uh, my son is three and a half now. His birthday's in January. So he just turned three when turkey season opened. And I wanted to start getting him introduced to it because I remember going out with my dad when I couldn't even hunt yet. You know, I would just tag along. I was terrified. He told me, watch out for the cats and the bears and stuff, you know, and I just remember stomping around the woods with my dad. And so I want to get my son into it because I'm really biased, but I want him to like the outdoors. <laughs> and so uh, family was the focus. I killed one bird right off the bat opening day with my dad. Um, we went out to a place that I know really well, and we actually struck up a bird, called him in, got to watch him come across an open field. I, I got it on film. I think you guys got to see it, but uh, he came in, and as soon as I shot, my dad flinched, and he shot and poked a 150 holes in my decoy and just laughed about that. And then after that, it was time spent with my son was the most important. So I went and I set up a uh, blind at a place that I know pretty well, too. It's some private land. It's really small, not super likely you're going to kill anything, but just wanted to get him out there so we went to a blind and he got to call and he got to run around and he got to make all kinds of noise and every time i'd, I'd yell he'd go oh, did you hear that you know <laughs> just stuff like that <laughs> and so was, i was like there's no way we're killing anything just because like we did hear a couple gobbles and he'd be like oh did you hear that and he'd say like just that loud you know it's, it's like you're not killing anything but you go on the video i think that he's getting to play with the box called he's having fun he's making memories um and then after that uh, i went to what was supposed to be bear camp went south to uh, the Roseburg area and I know some public land now that pretty well my dad showed it to me and we found it together when I was a kid. Um, I haven't been there though in eight years I looked was the last time that I went down there and it was with my dad and my brother and so uh, hunt bears in the morning and then during the day I would take them and just go drive around because the birds are out all the time and so we would just drive around I wanted him to see birds and we found birds in yards and we'd call to them. But uh, on the last day of bear camp, I was supposed to go bear hunting. Uh, my son asked me, Do not go, don't go hunt, dad. Let's make hot dogs and s'mores. And so I stayed home. I stayed at camp and uh, he actually wanted to go look for turkeys. So I loaded them up in the evening. I figured I'd go scout. I was going to hunt the next morning before we packed up and left. And uh, we get out there and he's, he's like, oh, there's birds, dad, there's birds. And he's recognizing turkeys. And uh, I got off right in the picture there. You can see the, uh, the gate there. And I hunted from that gate a lot when I was young and stopped, let out a crow call. I was like, what the heck, why not? Rolled down all the windows so they could all hear. I've got my wife and my one-year-old daughter in the back also. And the birds, the bird gobbled. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so I wasn't wearing any camo. Like in that picture, I had camo in the back of the excursion. And uh, my wife told me, go get them. And so I jumped out and threw on camo. Like I'm just wearing a regular t-shirt underneath that jacket. And it was hot and I'm wearing a jacket and winter pants because that's all I had in the car. And <laughs> went over there and <laughs> sweating. And uh, within 10 minutes, I found him. A couple of hens, I thought I lost him because the hens started yelping and uh, ended up he gobbled. I only place I had to hide was literally in a poison oak bush. Like I forgot why we stopped hunting at this place. It's just too much poison oak. And so uh, I didn't take my son with me because of that. I had no idea if he's allergic. My wife is not, but uh, I am deathly allergic. And so I didn't want him to get it. So he didn't come with me, but he was sitting in the car and could hear him gobbling and stuff. And uh, I'm only 150 yards from the car. And uh, so I call him up the hill and the bird comes in. I'm Stop, stop calling. I'm sitting in the poison oak bush. I actually was kneeling on one to smash it down out of the way so I'd have a shooting lane. And the bird came looking. He was looking for the hen. I didn't have a decoy, so I stopped calling when he got within 50 yards. And he came walking right up the trail and I let, let him have it in like 10 yards, stone cold dead. He didn't even move. And then uh, I got to carry the bird back and show my son. And he's standing there, you know, and he's poking its eyes and he's feeling this smooth head. And he just loved it. He got to take his picture. You can see him smiling so big in there. You know, he's having fun. And then 
as we're pulling away, you know, like one of the, the, the most proud moments I felt is like, I saw a bird off to the left down in someone's clearing, but I didn't say anything. I was, we were headed home. It, it was late. The babies were supposed to be in bed and uh, we're driving and he goes, dad, dad, gobbler, gobbler. And he's pointing down into the field. And I'm like, yes, there is a nice job. And I like reached back behind him because he sits behind me. And I was like, give me some knucks. And he reached over and he goes, boom, gives me some knucks. And my wife looks back and says, he's got the biggest smile on his face right now. You know, and like that, that's what meant the most to me. Uh-huh. And so and then the next, the next morning, like, cause like to me, that's, that's, that was my goal. You know, like that hunt right there is not a turkey hunt for tradition, right? Like you're not out in the woods grinding it. Like we stopped at a gate on public land, called one gobble and in 10 minutes he was dead. You know, like that doesn't happen very often, but my boy got to experience it, got to touch the birds. Like that was one of the first ones I ever got to bring back for him to see. So most of the time I'm pretty far from home when we're killing birds. And, uh, he got to see the other bird and him recognizing them that meant a lot. And then the next morning I went back to that same gate and hiked in like a mile or so and found another bird. And it was just, it was incredible. I hadn't been to that place in eight years, but like stepping like to that gate specifically, I remember a lot of memories with my dad and my brother hunting in those hills right there. And it felt good to go back and to take the next generation with me. So family was my priority this year and I was blessed to have a good season. I want to know uh, a story about, you know, tell me a little bit about, you and your dad hunting you know you said that this is like a a full 180 because you used to go hunting with your dad and your brother and now you get to take your son so tell me a story about you and your dad yeah me and my dad i mean we we before on x came around we used to drive four hours south of where we live i mean we used to pick me up on school after school on fridays and we would spend all weekend down there and we would do that multiple times during the year because we just didn't know where else to hunt he was taught how to hunt down there and uh like one of one of the memories that I, I still remember, I got a bad memory, but one of the memories that I remember when I was young before I could even hunt is like my dad always told me, all right, we're walking around. If you see a cat, like walking towards us, like don't just watch it, say something, you know? And he's like, <laughs> and so it's like, that always stuck with me. I always had a hard time sleeping before we'd go hunting. And uh, I distinctly still remember, it was, I don't know how young I was, but I could not even carry a gun yet. We're walking across the field and we get into the edge of timber and it's real thick, can't see a whole lot, but we see something in the bushes and it starts moving. And all of a sudden you just see a tail. And my dad says, cat, and I just took off running the other direction. And he's just, he's all hooping and hollering, like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to run. And it was a cow and that sucker just took off busting brush in the other direction. You know, and it's like stuff like that is the type of memories I'm trying to make with my boy. And I've spent a lot of time down in that particular area, hiking around and sitting in my dad's lap when I was little and him telling me, don't move, don't move. If you're going to look, you move your eyes and you slowly, slowly move, you know, and like stuff like that. And if my younger brother hunts with us as well, and there's been times where we've been told not to move so much that he's crying because his legs are cramping and peed himself. And it's just like, there's just so many fun, different types of memories that I have with my dad growing up that I can't share with my boy. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Obviously, congrats on a good season. Um, did you have any other challenges other than trying to drag a, a three and a half year old along with you hunting and having to tailor everything to be around that? Do you have any other challenges or any other difficulties uh, this season specifically? Just a kid for the most part. I didn't hunt a ton this year. I, mean, I was very efficient with my time, but uh, I spent a lot of time looking for a bear this spring. And then uh, my wife and I haven't always seen eye to eye on how much time I spend out in the woods. And so this year I told her that I was going to be a lot more consistent with family first, hunting second. So uh, for me, that's always been a challenge. I mean, it might not answer directly your question, but trying to balance my work life with my family and hunting. And so I try to take my son a lot more. And obviously that presents its own problems, as you know, with kids. And then other than that, just time, just finding time to go hunting without taking away too much from my family. Cody, um, this was a three bird season for you. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, Oregon lets you get three birds. Walk me through just a little bit about the nuances of the three birds. You, you told us the story of your son and you guys were kind of driving. You pointed out 10 minutes later, you know, it comes down the trail. But the, the shot with your decoy, was this all in the same week? How did you get, did you shoot them all? You said back to back days you got gobblers, but Give me the sequence of your three turkeys and what was the differences kind of between those three hunts? 
Yeah, so the turkey with my dad, where he shot my decoy, that was <laughs> opening. That was opening morning. Uh, sorry, opening afternoon. We went out in the afternoon. So I work um, with my family, and so we just took off early that day. And my dad and I bombed over. So that would have been like April fifteenth. And then I took my son out. And then the next week, and that's when we were messing around in the blind together and stuff. And then I took a huge pause on turkey hunting because I drew a bear tag on Oregon and wanted to uh, go hunt with some of the guys that I hunted with last fall. And so I spent a week down in Southern Oregon hunting, and then I came back, messed around a little bit up here. I was supposed to go to Eastern Oregon with Mr. Monzi there and go hunt turkeys uh, over in the wide open country over east, but I got the dates wrong. <laughs> we would have only been able to go for 24 hours. And my wife had prior commitments. And so uh, she told me if I wanted, let's go back to bear camp. And so I went, back to bear camp because that allowed us to stay a full weekend. And uh, we went down there and bear camp turned into Turkey. I just couldn't help myself. I couldn't help myself. The whole time I was down there the first week during the day when we we're killing time, I kept telling these guys, I was like, dude, we need to go look for turkeys. It's like 20 minutes away. We're not seeing any bears. Why don't we go look for turkeys? You know? And so this time we did, I went and went turkey hunting. So that was, I think it was like the 20th around the 20th of may so like over a month later is when i started hunting again like pretty hard i went with monzi a couple times in between but uh, i killed my bird on we'll say the 20th i don't remember the exact date i killed him with my family that was the family bird and then the following morning is when i killed the second bird those were my two public landers and the second one was in the morning because uh, i had to be back and packed up camp by 11 o'clock to check out up our little uh, campground that we were at that's awesome that's full season um I would like to hear about your, your mentoring experience. Um, it says that Bradley Joyce from Wild Food Outdoors mm -hmm. reached out to you and you helped him out. So can you tell me about that? I've got my, got my wild food shirt right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Bradley was a guy that I met last year through the On Point experience. He was one of the guys that was filming. And he reached out to us and he was like, hey, I want to learn how to turkey hunt. Obviously, you guys kind of know what you're doing. Like, will you take it? And so I told him, like, sure. So Monzi and I were both set up. To, I know Monzi's like a judge, too. It makes this weird. But he was highly, he's involved in a lot of my hunting as well. But uh, he reached out to both of us. And we're like, yeah, we work really weird schedules. We don't get to hunt very often together. But I was like, we will find time to take you, whether it's together or separate. And so I just had a random afternoon where I didn't have anything going on. And I asked my dad, I was like, can I leave work early? He said, sure. So I texted Brad like an hour away and i was like hey i'm leaving at one o'clock you want to go and he's like heck yeah and so he drove down got in my car and we drove about an hour south to where i hunt and uh this dude knew nothing <laughs> not the nicest guy in the world but he didn't know anything about turkey hunting he didn't have a shotgun he didn't have anything so i'm letting him borrow my gun and he's he's got on just his like hunting pack for like big game. And I was like, it'll work, but it's not perfect. And he even told me, he's like, I don't understand why people buy turkey vests. You already spent 600 bucks on a pack. Why are you also buying a turkey vest? Well, little sneak preview. By the end of the trip, he had ordered one on and he was on his way to his house. So it's like, he, so he's wanted to learn. So I told him, I was like, I'm going to take you. We're going to try and get you a bird and we're just going to teach you. Ask as many questions as you want. I'm going to assume you know nothing. And so we went to some places that I thought we would have a pretty high probability of seeing birds, at least get him on birds, get someone wanting to do it again. I mean, no one's real excited to go grind it out and not hear anything for a full day. And so we uh, we went to a piece of private that I, I've hunted for a lot of years. Um, there's always birds on the adjacent private. We have yet to kill one by calling him off, but that's part of our strategy in that area is calling him off of private onto pieces we can hunt. So we set him up and as we're like walking down the road, you know, and he, I'm trying to teach him how to be quiet. And, uh, all of a sudden some birds popped out in front of us. And so like, I just put my hand behind me and he just stops. And then we sit down and he hears gobbles and he actually got to see some birds. And he's like trying to figure out how to turn the safety off the gun. Like it probably would not have worked out if we actually got one to come in. But it's like, I'm just trying to teach him everything that I've learned over the years that my dad taught me, you know, and in the matter of a couple hours, right? Just an overwhelming amount of knowledge. And so then we just, we went to other places and we hiked into these places, you know, so you got the easy hunt where we were like 150 yards from the car, calling them out of someone's house. And then we tried going to big loop hikes and we saw birds and birds gobbled, but we never got one to come in. But by the end of it, he was pretty hooked to where he had ordered his pack. He was going to get his shotgun all set up. And next year, he said he actually really wants to grind it out and try to find a bird. So that was the only hunt I got to do with him, unfortunately. But that, that was kind of the mentoring experience that I had this year. It was interesting taking someone who's 
the same age roughly as me and not like a little kid with you trying to teach trying to teach them how to do something like that it was, it was an interesting experience it was fun cody what's your strategy when you engage with a bird like when when you get a gobble to kind of or a gobbler to kind of respond to you how are you playing this are you are you big time with calling are you a diaphragm guy are you a box call guy are you a slate guy uh you know what what's your strategies because to get to be as successful as you've been year over year, I mean, A, it took a good mentor with your dad, but then B, you've developed some skills and honed that over time. So what are some of the things that you are doing and employing year over year to find success? Because this isn't your first year to have more than one bird down at the end of a season. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously I've learned a lot from my dad. My dad has taught me a ton. Um, we, we're constantly adapting. So we use a little bit of everything, diaphragms, box calls, slates, uh, crow calls. Like we use everything um, until something works, right? You don't just go out in the woods with one thing. And so uh, my dad has always been a man of very little calling was his strategy. And so that's what I always did. You know, you hear a bird, you sit down, you don't move. <laughs> like that's the one mistake people move is they try to get closer or they're fidgeting or this and that. So my strategy has changed to where like now i feel comfortable enough to have an idea of when something is far away when something's close so like for example uh with the bird that i killed with my son come well they're in the car but when a bird i killed with them like i could tell he wasn't very far so the calling that i did was very little and he answered me pretty hard so i only used a diaphragm in that example and i did not have a decoy so if i have a decoy it's different too but without a decoy i'm not calling a lot so I called just a couple times. He answered. I knew he was coming my way because he got louder. And I just shut up because I want him looking for me. I don't want him to, to see where the decoy should be because their hearing is so incredible. I don't want him to be like, okay, there's no hen here. Like, I'm out. Like, he's like, oh, maybe maybe she was around the other bush. Maybe she's a little bit further. And it's so like, that was the strategy I used then was very little calling and almost ambush style, but with him headed in my direction. And then the following morning, I did an obsessive amount of calling. Like I, a friend sent me a video this year of a guy that was, uh, he makes calls. I can't remember the name of the company, but anyways, he makes calls. You know, like this is a thing I used to get the birds to fly across rivers, jump fences. And it's just like using two calls at once, your box call and your mouth call. And just like going nuts, which goes against everything I've been taught, but it works. And so like, we actually tried <laughs> it and my dad used it. He, he killed a bird. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like we call it like a cow party, right? You're over here, but you're a guy two calls and you're, like, bah, 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 and you're hitting the mouth call and you're hitting the box call and you're going 90 to nothing just like trying to tell him like get over here and my dad used it like a week before and it worked he was like no joke they flew across the road they came up and him and his friend tagged out on two birds and so it's like so i tried it i got their birds were on the other side of the property line and so i set up a decoy and i just sat there and i just i just didn't stop calling it felt like for a half an hour like you, you're just calling over the toms and you just sitting like the reason i was doing that too is you also got situational right which makes it kind of hard i knew those birds had hens because i could hear the hen calling she was not happy with me so like part of it's trying to piss her off part of it's trying to get the other bird to come and so yeah i just call a 90 to nothing but i will use a little bit of everything i tend to lean more towards a diaphragm because I just I feel as though I can control it better. I can get the sound that I want. Um, box call for locating, but a little bit of everything. And my strategy really changes, but the core principles of my strategy is don't move. Depending on the situation, don't call a lot and just let the bird look for you. So, but it is a little situational. Sometimes you got to go crazy. It's kind of like a Hail Mary. Right? You don't have anything to lose. They're on the other person's property. It's not like they're right around the corner. We're trying to come in on, you're just going to call 90 to nothing because you're not going to kill them anyway. So for the most part though, I tend to be a, a quiet and don't move kind of guy. Thank you guys for taking the time to listen. I mean, had a fun season, a fun season. And I wouldn't trade it for anything, especially with my little boy. Honestly, what stuck out of him right off the bat was like his energy. He was just all about it. You could tell, you tell the dude likes to, you know, kill turkeys and run them down, you know, and then the obviously, you know, hitting on the nose, you know, getting his kids, you know, first good bird like that. And the situation that he did it in was, you know, that's the memorable part of that. <laughs> yeah, totally miraculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Like, that, could not, that just shouldn't have worked out that way. Like, you know, we all, we all know you start making a bunch of rack. You got kids, you know, pounding in a creek and making noise. And you somehow get two to start hammering at you. You have no idea how long they've been going. It's crazy. Yeah. No, that's fun. All right, Audrey, what stuck out to you about Jordan's story? Um, I really like that he 
is trying to keep hunting fun for his kids. You know, he's really experience driven over success driven. And I, I like that. I like that um, to see that in hunters nowadays. And uh, I also like like the sense of place like those he had brought his sons there before and he could reference it, you know, the creek, the grass for it, all this stuff. And then yeah. he finally brought them back again. And his oldest son, who, like he said, had been hunting with him since he was what five or nine did he say yeah five years old they got that white tail (laughs) yeah and now and now he's 14 years old you know finally gets to harvest his first bird in a place that he knows like that's that's a great story so well me and him share a similarity you know i started hunting like climbing up my dad's lap pulling the trigger on a texas white tail too so (laughs) (laughs) love that (laughs) Uh uh-oh uh-oh pulling some heartstrings Yeah, I don't have the benefit of having the story in front of me, uh, but just like listening to that story and how it all went down, it kind of sounds like, at least with his boys, I don't know about the rest of his hunting career, um, but with his boys, sounds like they've been grinding for a while trying to get that one final success. And like, that is my story to a T, minus the kiddos. Like when I first started hunting solo, right after the Paratours introduced me to it, like it was six years before I killed a bird after that, you know, by myself. And so I can appreciate that just grind and keep going back to spots and keep working and tweaking little things um, so that that way you can finally get it done. Chase, we just we just met with Cody. I know you had some technical difficulties and dropped, but uh, talk about Cody Paratour and some of the things that you heard. I mean, you obviously saw his application. He had a really successful season. I mean, getting three birds, Cody, you know this from hunting Oregon. That's a that's a big deal to be able to put a tag on three birds in the same year. Um, but yeah, yeah. So Chase, what stuck out to you uh, about Cody? Well, I mean, his story sucks out anyway. But his he's like that all around like hunter in general. Like he's the guy that's you know he wants to be successful. Obviously, he's wanting to bring his kids up in it. He's you know, willing to help other people. And that's the biggest thing as far as, you know, the sport, the industry, all that's concerned is, you know, getting more and more people involved in it. <clears throat> and that's pretty cool. And then, you know, I get it too, because my son's two and a half. So, you know, anytime you can get him to do something cool like that, you know, and get him excited about something, that's, that's awesome. How about you, Audrey? Uh, you know, I really liked his mentor story. Um, he said that it's, it, it's not normal for him to like, have to teach a grown person how to do, you know, all this hunting stuff. But that's like all that I know, like mentoring wise is like teaching grown adults how to hunt. So, uh, you know, I like that he has that story and he's taken out more than just his family, uh, which is a big deal in in a lot of coordination, you know, um, with your family, you kind of just, I mean, pack them in the truck, you all live in the same place, but he had to like make the effort to coordinate with a whole nother person to go out there and show this person again changed his life right like he has a turkey vest he wants to turkey hunt now he's invested um created like another conservationist another hunter in that space and and i really like that i was gonna say would you call that like a really a win or not because we all know good and well like that's just another excuse to throw silly money at something now (laughs) (laughs) hey but that's hey that's where eaa saves the day because you guys sell these That's shotguns it. for way less money because if i had to go spend 1800 to two grand on one of these you know then i wouldn't yeah. have any money left to shotgun or turkey hunt but because you guys make these for i don't know six seven hundred bucks uh i can afford some of the other pieces of gear that are necessary <laughs> uh we all know it's a deep sport that's for sure yeah. All right. Yeah. Especially per pound on turkeys. You put a lot of effort in and you get a little bit of meat for it. You get you get a couple turkey nuggets. Um, all right, Cody, what stuck out to you? And I know this is a hard one because you can't just, you know, you know the man. So what yeah. stuck out to you about uh, Paratour season? Um, you know, kind of echo what other folks said for, for Cody. Um, I know because I hunted with him this year, like, Bringing Kate out was a huge um, goal of his. You know, I got to share a hunt with my wife and my one-year-old daughter, Olive, um, opening morning, and he was super stoked for that and just couldn't talk about how he couldn't wait to get Kate out in the woods this year. Um, And then 
for him to go out and take out Bradley is also a big step. You know, I think in, in previous uh, finalists, he's gotten kind of ripped up about only hunting with family or only hunting with good buddies. And so um, for him to take out Bradley was a big step because um, he is such a wealth of knowledge. Um, but he's not uh, he's working on getting good at taking other people that he doesn't know or people that he's just met. Um, and he was able to make it happen. I was supposed to take Bradley out too, and we got rained out and just couldn't ever reschedule. So I was excited to see that he got Bradley out and got him, you know, super excited about hunting and they got onto birds. And I know the area they were hunting, it wasn't, wasn't an easy, as easy hunt like Cody was describing, you know, it's private <laughs> land, they were smaller chunks, but it's, you gotta put some effort into those areas. Yeah, no doubt. And Cody is somebody that we know everybody in the hunt league community knows that guy's putting in the effort. I mean, the transformation that he went through over the last two years with his family, I, we're not going to dive into it, but like unbelievable success story. Cody is at the top of every list for the Western Hunter, Outdoorsman of the Year, the, the season that that guy has put together, the, the amount of work that he is putting in is just, it's unbelievable. All right, here's the tricky part. Let's do this. Let's do Jordan is one Cody is two I'm just gonna do a one two three and everybody's gonna flash their number on the count of three so and then and then we'll talk through why you would vote the way that you did does everybody feel like you can come up with the number Cody you are allowed to vote in the one two in, in this situation so <laughs> Don't, don't feel left out, but I want to see a number from everybody. We're all going to share our number and then let's, let's talk about it. We'll vote and we can, we can move on with life. So does everybody have their number? You got a gut feeling. Yeah, it's a roll. Everybody has to pick one. Audrey, you look a little bit torn. So that's why I'm not having Chase say his number first, because then it's like, yeah, I'm going to agree with Chase. No, we're keeping you. You have to have your own strong opinion here. All right. Everybody got a number. There's no number three, so don't flash that one. It can't be a one plus two. It's, it's a one or a two. All right, on three. One, two, three. Let's see it. Cody, what are you doing voting for Jordan? Do you just feel... Do you just feel like uh, <laughs> torn up about this? I mean, this is your buddy. You can't vote against your buddy. I know. Do I have to, am I going to have to show Pear toward this video? What am I going to do here? Oh, no, I'll tell him. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard because, uh, yeah, he's my buddy, right? Um, but, like, Jordan's story and, like, the the – feeling I got from it was that that grind that I can relate with, right? Like, I grinded a long time to kill birds and finally got to the point where now I've successfully had, you know, a couple three bird seasons and whatnot. And now he's grinding with his boys, grinding, grinding, and now they've, they've got that one, right? Everybody says, you got to get one, and then the rest of them are easy. Um, and with Parator, like, I love the guy to death. Um, he had a phenomenal season. But he also has a lot of three bird seasons. You know, there's a history there. <laughs> um, and yes, he had uh, shorter days to hunt this year, and he got he got Kate out and stuff like that. But for me, I like Jordan's story more of the years of grinding to get the one with all of his boys, as opposed to just another three bird season for Cody. With yes, the trouble of a three year, three year old dragging him along. But it didn't, for me, it doesn't weight quite as high. Okay. I think that's a fair explanation. And, and I think one that Cody will be able to swallow. He might punch you in the gut for it later, but I think he can get it. Um, Chase, why, why Jordan over Cody? I mean, I like the story, obviously. It's just, I mean, it's entertaining. There's no two ways about it. But his approach to it, like we're saying, the grind, and you have to really, really work hard to get that kid, that bird you know, his enthusiasm behind the whole thing. And the fact that, you know, Cody looks like he's got a pretty good shot at winning some other stuff too. You know, that's kind of what <laughs> sweet. Cody, Cody was like, I had to call Cody before this whole thing happened because I was like, well, I can't put Cody in because this week we're doing a playoff in the Western Hunter and there's four hunters left in it. And Cody is one of those. And Cody was also a candidate in the Outdoors of the Year. He won the on-point experience last year, which 
was not a league. So he was selected by Garrett, and that was kind of an independent thing as a person, the hunter that Garrett wanted to take with him on this bear hunt. It was it was through the Hunt League app, but it wasn't an official league of Hunt League. Well, when it came to the outdoors of the year this year, Cody, I mean, his season was unbelievable. He got his first bear. He traveled out of state, got a pronghorn, got a whitetail, got a mule deer, uh, went elk hunting with his family. Awesome, awesome season. Uh, but then he had, but then I think when it was the outdoors in the year, the judges were like, well, you already won like a big league this year. So I feel like he kind of got put on the back burner. And I'm like, I don't want him to be disqualified because he should be a league winner. But I also feel like, man, I'm not going to take anything away from the story. Like, this is the first candidate. Jordan's story is the first story that we've had a hunter that's a finalist that didn't actually kill a turkey this year. And I, and I absolutely love it. And the reason why he was elevated as a finalist is because his story was just that good. Like, it was like, that's what we're here to celebrate. That's the kind of stuff that we want to draw attention to. Well, the video of his son, you know, jumping up and down because he shot his first bird in his underwear. That's just where it's at. I mean, that's, that's just the <laughs> that, that wins. Okay, Audrey, you heard it. You've seen it on both sides. Now you, you met Jordan. You've met Cody. Uh, you, were t- you were struggling between the two. You were, you were, you were debating. <laughs> so what is it that I tipped was. you from Cody to Jordan and back and forth? So what, how did Jordan end up edging Cody out here? Yeah. So, um, you know, I was thinking of Hunt League, right? So we focus on the story, like what is the best story that was told? And I really liked um, Cody's dad story about him shooting the decoy. I thought that was hilarious. (laughs) And I love that he got it on video too. That just made it so much better. Um, (laughs) But um, I just, you know, he, he's super knowledgeable. And like you, like you said, or Cody, like you pointed out, he gets three bird seasons all the time. So like, I just feel like it wasn't a special enough season for him to win the 2024 Turkey. You know, like I think this, the, that Jordan had a really special season and his son got his first bird and in his underwear, like you said, like, yeah, it will never happen again. That That story will never happen. It's, it's a one of one story in all the U S I don't know that there was anybody else that shot one in their underwear unless they had one in their backyard and they walked out and shot it. You know, it's like, it's a one of one story on public land in your underwear. How does that even work? (laughs) Exactly. And like, you know, uh, in, in the application, it asks you, you know, what is special about the season. And, and for him, it's like, this will literally never happen to us again. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's why, that's why Jordan took it for me, for sure. Cody Monzi, you are the 2023 Gobbler King. It is your job and responsibility to pass the torch to the 2024 champion. So my friend, would you do the honors? Jordan, uh, we loved your story. Uh, we loved the grind and the commitment to keep taking your boys out and get after it and finally, finally get that one uh, to start that even more successful venture. And it's my pleasure to award you the 2024 Gobbler King Award. That's amazing. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Love it. Dude, I'm so excited for you. That story... It was actually so incredible. All the judges just resonated with it for so many different reasons. Uh, They came back and said, man, Cody had an incredible year, but he has a lot of incredible years. This was something that was super special. And you actually are the first winner of one of our leagues where you didn't harvest the species that was the target (laughs) species for the league, uh, personally yourself. And I'm like, I love it. That's what I want. I want Hunt League to be about the story, not just about who kills the most and who kills the biggest. So that is going to be a memory that you guys will have forever. I think there's plenty of stories where somebody may have gotten three birds and may have had their families. But I was like, is it even possible that there's one other person that shot a bird on public land in their underwear? <laughs> <laughs> and got there make it plus it's the first bird all this story it was just like how do you do that it was just incredible so again brother thank you for sharing your story with us that's exactly what we're looking for the type of stories that we want to celebrate now bear's not with you is he so my son bear's not with me this is my son brody he was there for the whole thing What's up? he witnessed the whole story and uh yeah it was an amazing day that we'll never forget so thank you guys wasn't it fun yeah
Yeah, Brody, you're up next. You got to. I don't know how you're going to one up your brother's story, but somehow uh, you got to put yourself in contention. Okay. Brody just pulled his first black bear tag and his first pronghorn tags today, so he's starting. Oh, there we go. Going into fall. All right. Well, Linscombe family, you guys have an awesome day. Congratulations, Jordan, on taking home the title of the 2024 Gobbler King. Hey, thank you, Jared. Thank you, Cody. We love Hunt League, and we'll keep spreading the word. We love the app, and uh, so honored to win and be a part of this. Thanks, guys.